Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Place. Tonight, we are so honored to have Bob Greaves here with us, and um, I'm sure you can see him already. And Bob, give everybody a shout out. <laughs> How are you doing? Good to be here. It's such a pleasure to have you. I know we have been uh, well acquainted over Facebook, and my husband has spoken to you on the telephone, and he did nothing but brag about you, and was so excited to, to talk to a kindred soul uh, on the phone. And so I want you just to do what you do best. Bob is a musician, an educator, a pastor. He's a fantastic um, husband, father, and those things don't come last with Bob, that's for sure. But he is certainly multi-talented, and uh, we're just proud to have him here. Certainly, and Bob, I want you to uh, just let your hair down tonight, if you would, because I, we, we really do enjoy, you know, seeing people like you who don't mind being honest. A lot of people really put on a show, and you're not one for that at all. It seems as if you want to be completely transparent about theology. And tonight I'm looking forward to having that that transparent discussion about, you know, theology. Uh, that, that's Excellent. That, Excellent. Yes. You know, I, even for myself, I found that becoming disentangled from, uh, you know, I don't owe any organization anything. So uh, I'm it gives me a certain freedom that would be difficult to have, I suppose, if you're worried about your job, or you're worried about, uh, you know, your connections and all that. So I, you just launch out and be yourself, you know. What what changed your entire paradigm? Uh, and I would like for you to go back into uh, into your history a bit, if you would, and and tell everyone how things changed. I mean, you were sharing with me how you were a pastor in a conventional way, and all of that has uh, shifted quite a bit. Could you share some of that with us? I, I suppose that um, in, in some ways the foundation really goes back to the very beginning for me that my, my first experience of God subjectively that I remember is, you know, as a six-year-old at an Episcopal church uh, during the winter. And it was very cold winter that that year. And uh, we'd get into the church and downstairs into the area where we hang up our coats. And I started leaning against this door that was very warm. And um, one of my older sisters uh, asked me if I knew why the door was warm, and I had no idea. And she said, "That's they keep God in there." <laughs> and <laughs> I I believed her, <laughs> and uh, it shows you how gullible I was. But but um, uh, nonetheless. I, that whole winter, I would make sure I was the first one in the family to get the coat off and hung up so that while the uh, six other kids and my mom and dad were getting themselves uh, un, you know, uncoated, I, I would lean against that door and it just the sense of being just close to God, silent, nothing to talk about, nothing to think about, but just, just enjoying the presence of God. Uh, that became for me the start of my spiritual experience. And... I think that as I became a fundamentalist, uh, later uh, as a result of uh, a crisis of faith that my mentor was going through, and I ended up going to a very hyper-conservative Christian school where they knew what they were talking about, um, I, I suppose that that always failed that authenticity of the relational closeness of, of, of God, and so it, it just, it was probably destined from the very beginning to fall apart for me. Uh, but also, I think being raised in a home where my mom and dad were both uh, very good at critical thinking, uh, and perhaps as parents, a little too good. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I, you know, it, it really forced me to: is that really true? Is that really honest? Does that really work? Does that really make sense? And I suppose that as as things began to fall apart, I just I just had to it, it had to break for me. But the specific issues were uh, in the study of language that I loved, you know, and I, um, when I was pastoring a, a very small church uh, in mid-state New York, there was, um, it's time reading the Septuagint and reading the, the, the Hebrew Old Testament and trying to read quotes of the Old Testament in the New Testament. As, as I'm looking at the way that language worked back and forth and all that, it uh, just the old paradigm of, 
of certainty and of clarity and of what words meant uh, was was beginning to fall apart and I began to study more in the the nature of language and the more I got into it the more I realized that my old views just didn't have a foundation to stand on. They began to fall apart and I ended up really in a sense returning to that original simple presence of God and uh, turning to a, where the only thing I'm really certain of is a very subjective reality that I can't even explain being the indwelling Christ. Um, my Savior is a, is a Lord that uh, is close to me, loves me, and uh, my relationship is with him, not my understanding of him. And um, that also made it very free for me to say, well, when I try to understand things, um, I, I'm free to just explore the field. And uh, I've enjoyed that freedom. <laughs> yeah, I, I can understand that completely. It, you know, in our conversations um, and also in your writings, especially on Facebook, it seems as if you are not so much of a text worshiper. Would that be a fair statement? <laughs> yeah. I uh, Now, I, I find in the text what I would call a, a, a genuine witness of the, uh, the experience of God uh, uh, very authentically in the lives of those who, who wrote it. But I don't see this as anything that escapes the problems that words have for all of us. Uh, that because it's not the just because of our incompetence with words; it's the nature of language itself. Um, it's a uh, you know, it's a it's a use of reference and symbols to try to uh, communicate a meaning that is only referred to through words that possess a general domain that attempt to hone in on that meaning. And and uh, so as a result, uh, there's only so far you can take it. Well, you know, when dealing with uh, both Old Testament and New Testament, there are several things that I want you to share with the people. Uh, number one, let's talk about the languages and also the text in, in this sense. Uh, one of the things that we know about the New Testament, uh, the kind of Greek that was used, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was accepted by all Greeks. Uh, no. No, and it was a language that was actually lost. Uh, it had to be found. It was resurrected, and it's still under reconstruction. And the same thing can be said in a in a similar sense to even the Hebrew text. And so, you, you know, uh, the Hebrew language, and also uh, that would be First and Second Temple Hebrew, and also Aramaic. But my point is, we have reconstructions of these languages, and we also have the reconstruction process of the text. And so many people are, are dogmatic about the text and dogmatic about these languages as if we have a language model that's completely accurate. And yeah. What, what's, what's so disingenuous about that? Because I, I, I think it's spurious to think that, but I think that you have spoke so well about that. I want you to articulate uh, something well in, in that context. I, I think it actually begins with a personal insecurity. That is that when we're not sure of ourselves and we, we're not sure if God loves us, we, uh, we want to find something we can really just nail down to the floor. And I think we're hoping that it's going to be the word. Many people will say, well, what does the Greek say? Well, what does the Greek say? And uh, I, I only know one preacher who's a Greek and he says pretty much the same thing anyone else says. No, uh, no I, uh, it's a joke, but uh, the, uh, I think the, the insecurity of that or the, the desire to find something that proves my faith instead of letting my faith be faith, uh, I think that's part of where it comes from. But then the tradition itself is so long standing that we just get swallowed up into it before we realize we're there. But um, I mean, when one looks at the semiotic nature of language, when one looks at the way that it's that it's structured, language was never even capable of of, of giving to us that sort of precision. It's kind of like surgery with a uh, with a hacksaw. Um, I mean, we communicate fairly well, but we don't have any idea just how difficult a, 
uh, that can be to be so accurate is to be metaphysically accurate about everything anyone ever said, pulling apart their language to get right down to the nitty gritty of all the, the reality and details as if we could, you know, psychoanalyze God and pull it all apart. But in terms of uh, the Greek language, uh, from my understanding, Koine Greek is the Greek that was used for the New Testament. And Koine Greek was, some people call it common Greek, but it was not common to the Greeks. It was common to the Greek realm. Alexander the Great and his army used this simplified dialect of Greek, which people who um, were people of stature in Greece kind of looked down on it. Uh, but it was the language of the realm, and it was for everyone in the realm a secondary language, including as the dialect, it was a secondary language for even those in Greece. And uh, it survived as the Roman Empire came in, uh, rather than, you know, teach everybody Latin or whatever, I have a language in the realm, and so that continued on until about about 400 AD, uh, Koine Greek was, was common in the, in the realm, but again, it's a secondary language, and uh, although I don't think I need to say too much about it, people were to just Google and look at some of the linguistic dynamics of a secondary language, we find that, so if you tear apart Koine Greek, unless you're looking at the primary language of the people who are using it, um, you're, you're going to misunderstand the way they're using it because most people who use a secondary language use it as if it obeyed the same rules and paradigms as their mother tongue. Uh, uh, unless they are particularly well educated and uh, you know uh, that uh, there will be some will do that but then you know the Koine Greek really just died out of use by the time uh, you get to around 400 uh, AD and the Latin Vulgate and other Latin versions became the, the version of the Bible that was the authoritative version as it were and back then we didn't know enough about language to know that that could present some problems but by the time we start getting to where people are interested in the Greek again, and uh, although they continue to preserve various texts, um, uh, more or less, they uh, when they wanted to really learn the language again, they realized this is not classical Greek. It's not the, the, the Greek that has survived. It's not modern Greek. And they, they knew enough about language to know, well, what is it? And for over 100 years, the church was under the illusion that the Greek of the New Testament must have been some Holy Ghost dialect, some special exactly. dialect. And under that, the church, uh, the Roman church at that time, redefined so many Greek words based on their theology and uh, the way that it was used and understood from the Latin Vulgate. And let, so, let, I've got to jump in here because you're really saying something that I keep nuancing you're saying, and I want to be clear about this, you're saying that the church basically inserted a theological gloss, not really realizing what the Greek actually said. Would that be true? That's right. The, the, the nuanced meanings of any language only survive in the lives of the people who use that language as their primary tongue. Certainly. The real dictionary of any language is in the culture that uses it. Uh, and, and the written dictionaries are merely an attempt by somebody to kind of summarize it. But the, the, the real rules of language exist within a culture, and that culture died out. It was gone. And so any of the real particulars of the nuanced differences um, uh, are, are just lost. They're gone. And uh, we can reconstruct them in terms of um, knowing the sorts of constructs that, that were there, but we could never be absolutely certain that in any given situation that it, that just a single word in a particular context does not actually possess a, a very significant and clear meaning to the people in that uh, original uh, culture that is somewhat different than what it might, that word might seem to indicate given its, um, its apparent literal meaning. And as a result, Every time you're reading in the New Testament any word that feels to you like a churchy word, words like saved, elect, church, <laughs> uh, repent, you anytime you're reading any of these churchy words, you're reading them with, uh, with the churchified understanding of them. And I'm not saying that they necessarily inserted it into the, by re-altering the Greek text. 
but by re-altering the Greek dictionary, so, uh, these words are now defined this way, and the, their roots and are, are kind of, they spin a story to try to reconnect them to their original in a way that works for the theology. And although th there's no doubt some truth in that, uh, it's a big deal of the guesswork and an awful lot of spin. And I think that we need to realize that's what we're up against. And uh, in terms of trying to recreate an understanding of, of the language and its meaning, I don't think it means we're just like totally, completely in the dark, but I do think it means we got a lot of homework to do. I completely concur. Uh, one of the things that I've tried to emphasize over the years is the idea of intellectual honesty, spiritual honesty, and scriptural honesty. With that stated, it's, it's impossible, for instance, if you go to uh, the writing system of the Hebrew uh, to suggest that it is any, uh, anything that can be uh, accurate in the sense uh, of what we know as accuracy in English, for instance. Uh, right. If you deal yeah. with what's called an abjad, uh, yeah. you're simply dealing with a writing system that's consonantal alone, and so the speaker or the writer, he knows what he's saying, but yet he doesn't leave to the reader something that's intelligent enough that's not ambiguous. And so, right. you know, when people study the quote-unquote scripture, they need to be honest enough to say the writing system itself does not lend to accuracy models, but it there's simply... A, it there's is, a analogy that I think would work well here. Everyone has seen these optical illusions where, you know, you're looking at it, in one moment it looks like an older lady looking down, and the next moment it looks like an, a younger lady looking away. We've know. seen various optical illusions like that. Uh, that kind of language creates the optical illusion that, oh, it's this word when it could be another word. Exactly, exactly. So, so the, I, I think that a lot of people are not willing, they're not willing to be honest with the text. And my question is, why do you think people are afraid of being honest with what the text is? I, I would ascribe that to at least two different causes I can think of. One is, I think we all have a tendency to want to understand the world in what I would call a monoaxial way. That is, we try to find a way of making things to us seem coherent. And once we find a way of making it coherent, we're done. We, we don't think that, you know, maybe there's more than one coherent way of understanding it. And, and I think a, a multi-axial axial way of, uh, of trying to understand things, try to determine if there's a number of coherent ways that seem to work in understanding something and allow yourself to live in that conundrum. I think we have a natural aversion to that conundrum. But, but the other thing is that um, I think that God has become a coping mechanism. I, I, I do believe that my life is Christ, uh, that, that the indwelling Christ and his presence in me is 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 that power, and power is just a horrible word, I, there, I can't find a word for it, that, that it, you know, the, the reality of his presence in me is what, what I find to be the root of what gives the challenge of life meaning, the, the purpose of love, uh, making so much sense and all that, but this is very inarticulate stuff, and I think that until we realize that we have all we need in Christ, we, we, before we realize that having what we need in Christ means not having a lot of things we think we need, <laughs> I, I guess we just turn to Bible worship and hope that we can uh, obtain the things we want religion to obtain for us. Okay, let me stop you. You just said Bible worship. Did I miss here? Uh, no, I did. I said oh, Bible okay. worship. Yeah. Uh, many people are involved in Bible worship, and I, I think that's uh, unfortunate. I, I, it, and you know, I think some people are involved in science worship. You know? well, I, I, I can't um, disagree with that. I, I, uh, I think that uh, although 
credible data is absolutely credible data. I think there's a lot of things that, in fact, if there's one thing that science proves every day, that it proves anything, here is yet one more thing that is absolutely true, and up until now, we did not know it for certain. So science actually proves that there are a lot of things we don't know. Exactly. That are nonetheless true. And so to uh, minimize myself to only knowing those things that we have so far proven is um, uh, hedging your bets off on the ditch to the wrong side. You're overcorrecting, <laughs> you're missteering. Uh, so I, I think I see this actually as really kind of a problem all people have, whether they're religious or irreligious. There's this desire to somehow nail down the world without, without in uncertainties and to just have it all figured out. And you know, in a sense, as we're children of God, I think there's a sense in which we'll never have it all figured out, and we don't have to. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So what you're actually suggesting and I completely agree, is that the orthodoxy of science will shift almost on a daily basis, and that's good. And the same thing is true with religion in a sense. And so we, we do not need to park our minds and fix belief. We need to allow room for growth so we can move forward. Right. Now, many people are worried that that becomes a slippery slope. And for the person who's interested in manipulating... It's a very slippery slope, but the rigid uh, uh, alternative is is to say is to keep us in the spiritual dark ages. I mean, if it took us till now to really get into quantum physics, what what makes us think that our apprehension of human nature, of of what it means for Jesus to have become a human being, uh, mm. What makes us think that we had that all figured out back when Paul wrote the New Testament? Sure. <laughs> That's absurd. Uh, uh, there's uh, something that I think I mentioned to you before was that when it comes to trying to make sense of the reality that we all live in, uh, we have to realize that, first of all, none of us are really in touch with reality through anything other than our perception. So we've already experienced a biological reduction of what it is we're looking at. You know, so we're already cut off from it in a sense. That doesn't mean we're thereby given license to think anything we want and turn it into anything we can kind of spin it into. But um, it, it, it presents us with that real problem of uh, uh, we're finite human beings and we don't know things we don't know until we discover them. That's and good. that's just the way it is. And this is part of our, our faith. We, uh, it, the death. The burial, the resurrection of Christ was an event, not a doctrine. Thank God. And as an event, I can believe the event occurred without feeling that, and so what that actually accomplished and what it <laughs> did was, and so God is thinking, and you know, it, um, I, I, I don't, I, it's great to, to wonder about that and think about it and even try to see what we can know about it, but that's all. Um, in some ways kind of irrelevant to the fact that it, it was an event and our trust in Christ is the trust in a person not a trust that and of course, he's going to do this for me right he's going to do that for me and then, then this will happen and that will happen and he's this kind of a person right and I, I, I we're putting our faith too much in in our faith and I don't have faith in faith my faith is in Christ and and Christ is whoever he is uh, and not to, not to just kind of deny the ability to know anything about him, but in terms of the settling of my faith, the, the motivation of my faith, that which pushes me on to want to know more, is already relaxed, it's already at rest, it's already settled in the person that he knows he is. Right, that's wonderful, that's beautiful. My wife had uh, <laughs> copied down a quote, I want her to uh, read that quote, would you? Is it the one about love? Or? Right. Both. Okay. Uh, I had a great time uh, going through uh, your blog and uh, um, reading some of your older blogs, and um, I really familiarized myself with just a little touch of, of, I guess, the way you think about certain things. And one quote I want to bring out to you um, I thought was really awesome. It says, love on its mission 
passes by the temptations, often unaware of them because it's busy with other things. And do you remember what, you know, motivated you to write that? Or was it, is it something specific in your life that you recall? Well, certainly my, my philosophy of, of love as a motivation involves a focus. Uh, one that I would consider a, a positive focus. That is, um, in, in my life, I'm motivated to move toward things rather than away from things. And um, you know, where's the law? Is 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 certainly you know, don't do this, don't do that, and and that brings my focus on all the things I shouldn't do. Like Paul said, you know, thou shalt not covet. You know, oh, well, that's a great idea. <laughs> you know, oh, it's coveting in you of every every sort. Not that you're actually thinking out loud. That's a great idea, but it occurs to you now that you. Whereas, as I understand love, love is um, at our core value a. A mystery of recognizing that the value of the image of God indelibly uh, imprinted into every human being is something mysteriously very valuable and looking at its beauty or seeking to find its beauty is something that compels me to want to honor it, reveal it, uh, rejoice in it and, and in doing that I, I'm busy. <laughs> I don't have time to think about. Oh, he's got some money. He's not watching that. I, get, yeah. uh, I heard somebody this last weekend say something like, "Love does not need a stop sign." If you love your fellow man and you were arriving at a an intersection and there's no stop sign at the, if you love your fellow man, you slow down to look to see what might be happening. Um. Love doesn't require a law, uh, and and love is so busy doing that which has value, compelled toward it, that um, in a sense it just you know being a finite person, I only I can only think of so many things at a time. <laughs> I mean, I really appreciate that. Um, also, um, reading through your uh, your blogs, it made me think that you don't. And actually, I think you came out and specifically said it that there really aren't any absolutes um and i don't want to expand it to say in life but we can narrow it down and say in scripture the bible and the text is that something that you you hold true or did i misrepresent you i i think that that becomes an issue that is very difficult to make clear because most people are caught up in what I see as a silly argument about absolute versus relativism. I saw uh, that um, this the, afternoon with Alan about moral relativism. Um, <laughs> now that you brought that up, I, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I think that there's no such thing as relativity without it being in relation to an absolute. <laughs> So I, I definitely believe in both relativism and absolutism, and uh, there's a sense in which the objective universal absolute of the universe is what the universe is, but I as a being only perceive it from my vantage point, and as a result, in spite of the fact that the world, the reality, God, the Bible, everything that I could ever um, struggle with, as a human being, I can only have a relative grasp of it. And so, to me, relativism has to do with my perception, my subjective experience. But absolutisms uh, uh, are something that only God has access to. Uh, now, certainly through physics, I can determine what might appear to be certain mechanical absolutes. But uh, um, and that's only because of their great consistency that I can rely on that to any degree. But uh, if it weren't for its consistency that we're already a part of what it is before I had observed it and independent of my observing of it, uh, I couldn't even know about those absolutes. So I believe in absolutes and I believe that all relativity is based upon absolutes, but that as a human being, I can only have a relative grasp of something, which means I never have the full picture, never have the full story, I have only, I only can know that which I've been exposed to personally. Right. 
All right. Let me ask you a theological question. This sure. is not the kind of theological question that is not common, and I think that you know where I stand, and so I'm going to stand in the position more or less in that context of the church that keeps talking in that Christianese. And when, when, when I read, for instance, Romans chapter 5 from the King James Bible, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We were talking on the phone about justification, a forensic yes. term or judicial term. Uh, and in most schools of thought, that is in theology, most people think that somehow we had to be declared righteous in a legal sense before God so we can actually go to heaven. And yeah. I want to know what you think about that. I really want you to just reveal yourself, get really transparent here, and tell me what you think about this forensic argument of this soteric thing that people like to spin as getting saved to go to heaven. I, I think of uh, when uh, Captain Spock in Star Trek asked his dad, why he married the human, and he said, um, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> uh, I, I think that there is something in the forensic analogy that can give us a picture. But I think what we have done is we have now taken the analogy and swapped it for the reality. And uh, we've lost that reality. I, I think that in some ways, thinking of it in terms of a forensic concept is helpful. But I don't think that justification, first of all, it's a, one of those church words. Exactly. And I don't think that when it was used in the New Testament originally, that the people who read it said, oh, so there's a doctrine of justification. <laughs> I think the word just kind of rolled out uh, as one they were familiar with and that conveyed an idea. But uh, in terms of getting deeper at what's lying behind it, I don't know that all the verses that deal with justification necessarily try to get down to the core of it. Uh, most of the New Testament strikes me as being the language of application, not the language of description. Uh, so it's not trying to explain things, it's trying to help you relate to things. And there's a difference in how you would do that. Uh, when you're trying to get people to relate to things, you talk uh, simple and straightforward and uh, about very complex things. Uh, but when it comes to justification, my understanding of it is that um, there's a sense in which uh, the things we've done wrong, that we shouldn't have done wrong, um, there's a level at which we know we shouldn't have done that. And uh, we can't defend our, our behavior. But I think there's also a level at which in our ignorance and our lostness, and particularly when we reconcile, where all of that can be kind of just uh, done away with, forgiven, reconciled, and, 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 and resolved, so that what remains are many times our gullible, our naive, and our foolish attempts to really uh, try to figure out how to honor ourselves. And that it turns out that there's also a level at which we really had a very good reason for doing everything, even the stupid things we did. We just weren't thinking as clearly and as honestly as we should. So I, 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 but I, so I get the impression that, that in justification, that in Christ, that I am becoming the person in Christ who is um, perfectly, uh, you know, the person who's, as I take on that character Christ, I have, I have every really good reason for doing what I do and feeling what I feel and thinking what I think, even as part of the process before arriving, even while in mistakes and errors and, and, and misunderstandings. And that, therefore, whatever's wrong with what I'm doing is no longer the issue. And the, the, so it's more like that. Uh, the NIV translators, uh, they used a dynamic equivalent of translation theory. It's, it's quite synthetic, but one of the things that they did state in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is that love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. No. 
And if that's true, and <laughs> and also if you you agree with this, I'm simply trying to understand, especially I see exactly where you're going with it. Okay. I, I, you know, when I when you look at your kids, uh, if I think if you're a good parent, you don't look at them and you say, "Well, they did that wrong. Well, that's wrong. Well, you know, what are you, what are they thinking there?" Um, the best way to work with a developing child is to find out what is it they're doing right and build on that. So you're suggesting our Heavenly Father's not looking at our wrongs, holding them against us. They're irrelevant to Him. So They are not even a problem for Him. So Bob, and, are, are, are you suggesting that Jesus did not come as an atonement to satisfy this God who was keeping a record of our wrongs against us? Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, I think that's a horrible lie that, uh, that uh, Jesus didn't come to save me from his Father. Thank that's right. God. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah I, uh, now, I, it's, it's a shame people feel that way, but I think they're, they're pushing their guilt and their worry upon God. So you actually believe that God is just simply looking for some good in us, something to work with, uh, very much in a, a parent style. Would that be accurate? Uh, absolutely. In fact, I would, uh, if, if I had any theology of atonement, I believe that every aspect of the atonement had everything to do with what we needed before we could find a rational reason to let go of our own guilt. I don't think God had any problem with our actual guilt, our actual wrongdoing. I don't, I, I mean, I'm not saying that he's saying, oh, go do whatever you want. It is a problem, but the problem is not, well, you're doing wrong things. That's not the problem. That's just the way the problem manifests itself. And certainly that's gotta be taken care of, but it's not the root of the problem, and therefore focusing on it is absurd and ridiculous, but we do that. I don't think God does. So the doctrine of propitiation, that is God becoming the one who becomes satisfied, maybe we should look at it differently as if God came to satisfy our thirst instead of him trying to achieve some kind of satisfaction because he, he couldn't stand to be around us according to I think it, yeah, some pictures right. of I, theology. I think he's certainly not needing to find a way of coping with our foul stench. Um, I, I think, though, that we ourselves can get very lost, all of us can get very lost into self-hatred. Uh, we, we've probably all been there. And it, there's a level at which it becomes almost impossible to believe that God could really, could he really forgive me? You know, and yes, <laughs> look at your own children. Could you ever really forgive them? <laughs> it's, it's almost silly to ask. That's true. Um, but yet, when we think of ourselves, I think we needed to propitiate ourselves. I think we had to experience this propitiation of who we imagined God is. Now, I don't, uh, you know, those who've worked for an employer probably know what it is to sometimes realize I'm being called on the red carpet, or I'm being called on the carpet, I'm gonna have to answer for something the boss wants to know about. And you go in there, and uh, although, depending on the quality of the boss you have and what the issue is. Sometimes we, we end up going uh, to um, give an account for something and we discover that uh, somebody was really rather pleased with us and, or that their reaction was not the negative reaction we expected. And, and, and I do think that in, there's a sense in which the person who has not yet trusted uh, the love of God is, is definitely anticipating, well, he's got to be pissed with me. Um, and um, this helps to, um, um, you know, alleviate that. And, and I think that uh, once we finally get to know God, we find he, he's missed us terribly. And uh, there was a real isolation that, was, that resulted from the, the issues we were going through, but that... Um, uh, he was more than, uh, you know, he just missed us terribly and, and sought to redeem the situation completely. If I'm not misunderstanding you, 
and please tell me if I am, it doesn't sound like you believe in hell. Um, well, you know, certainly not in the conventional sense. And, and, and I'll be honest with you here, as I look at it, I, I am not entirely decided what it is I think about it. But I, I do know this, it isn't what I hear people say. Um, or what is more commonly believed. I, um, first of all, I'll just, you know, one of the things I like about Charles Finney with his, uh, his desire, I don't think he always achieved it, and none of us do, but you know, his desire to make, you know, true to faith, true to scripture, true to reason. Um, he realized that we can't just go with a concept we get from the Bible only simply because it can be read in there somehow consistently. There's some concepts that just simply don't make sense. And, and here's one for me that is a biggie. I can see how subjectively knowing Christ would be very important for my own personal spiritual journey. But I have a hard time trying to decide that it could even be right that a person's eternal destiny is going to be determined entirely by something that is unverifiable and indeterminable and that is based upon a way of looking at things. Uh, I can see how that can, uh, you, not knowing who Jesus is, I, I mean, it can keep you from him, but it doesn't, um, but, but if, I, I mean, you and I only met recently, uh, right. but before, before you and I met, the Jesus who lives in you knew me and he loved me and before i met you the jesus that lives in me he knows you and he loves you but until you and i met we didn't even know each other and so there's this need for the subjective experience but it, it, it's crazy uh, it's kind of like thinking that unless you happen to know me well you know and, and know that i love you and that you love me and that in christ we're brothers well then you just have to go to hell <laughs> i mean that's that, that's absurd. I don't see how our eternal destiny can rest on a thing that's indeterminate. Of course it can. Uh, it, so, I, but I do see this on the other side. I do think we have some serious problems. And these serious problems make, it, make us people that are difficult to get along with. Uh, you know, uh, I, I learned that being married <laughs> can be difficult to live with. But I'm I'm in a process, you know, and and I do think that we are in need of kind of being prepared, as it were. So if there's any way in which I believe in hell, it would be that I see it as 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 a place where those who just in this life, for whatever reasons, couldn't seem to uh, put it together and embrace Christ, will will go through boot camp, as it were, and and I think that there'll be suffering there, but in the sense of coming face to face honestly with what they've done what it did how it affected people what they should have done how how they should have, so I, I do believe that that that's going to be a very difficult time so if there's any way that i could believe in hell it would only be in that kind of a context and so so, and, so what you're saying is this this atmosphere of perfect uh, of excuse me this atmosphere of imperfection that we live in is perfect for maturing Oh, absolutely. Um, God has designed the universe in such a manner as evil will eventually have to run out of options and love becomes the only sane choice remaining. That's and powerful. it's just a matter of time before we all get to that point. P please state that again. That's, that's powerful. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I, I just it just came out. So oh, okay. <laughs> well, we have it recorded, so we'll give it to you later. <laughs> that is that is wonderful. That's wonderful. You know, you need to get your guitar out and do a song right now with those words. I mean, that is awesome because you know, love works with imperfection perfectly. Yes. Yes. Uh, in fact, imperfection is in some sense a biased uh, a word of perspective. Uh, from God's standpoint, it might be uh, more a sense of uh, developmental uh, process. Right. Uh, you know, I, I have a different position on hell than you do. It's, it, and, and it's probably just a word game here. I, I do not look at heaven, quote-unquote, in a literal sense 
as a lot of people do. I, I do think that we go to be with the Father, but I think that when we die, I don't think that boot camp is over because I think that we're progressively learning. I don't feel like yeah. as if we have meet this perfect mark at any time in our life, either on this side of the fence or on the other. And uh, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And so uh, whether we want to call it hell on the other side or heaven, I think it's superfluous in a sense. So um, people that happen to be born in Ouagadougou, West Africa, actually they changed the name to that to Burkina Faso, and then they changed the name of that to something else. But if they happen to be born there and didn't get an opportunity to hear about this Christ, then you're saying that they'll probably go to, to a boot camp to be introduced to him, possibly. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, now, in a sense, we may be inventing um, teachings out of the air, but then again, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so Through our knowledge I don't of have him. a problem believing that there may be things that are so that are just none of our business. Right. I like your honesty. I agree with that. Uh, that that's that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So uh, when when it comes to the death of Christ, this is a major, major, major thing in theology. Jesus came to satisfy his Father. That is to bleed and die. That is so his Father could do something good for us. Uh -huh. And it doesn't sound like that. That's what you're preaching or teaching or advocating. Uh, no, now certainly Paul said we preach Christ crucified, and uh, so I mean I do see the, the the cross as extremely central, but I, I see that more as God bridging to us and being something that from God's standpoint was completely irrelevant. You know, my husband uh, teaches this, and um, he's brought this out over the last month uh, strongly that the cross is central to this theme that here you have Jesus, God himself, some believe, and I believe, and here he goes to the cross, and he's making this huge statement that, you know, this is what your religion or theology will do, will absolutely take the most perfect human that could be God himself and crucify him and that's murder. what exactly yeah. exactly and, and I'll, when you realize that God himself now first of all I don't believe in a uh, uh, God Almighty is not for me a power based personality and in fact God Almighty is a bad translation I agree um, you can say something I said I agree and but my my understanding of God is a character based understanding, and I think that alters that entire dynamic. Um, and to think that the character of God, that character that has been also Jesus said, you know, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God is love. Uh, he's not this this spooky thing that. Um, I, I, I'm not even sure where in the Old Testament I, I, I stand on this, but I get the impression that the entire mosaic thing was an experiment deliberately intended to fail. <laughs> so, okay, it was your idea. You thought this would make sense. It didn't work. What do you think now? Uh, but uh, I, when, when this character of love comes to us and our reaction to him is we murder him, right. and he lets us get away with it, and then there's a sense in which his comeback is, see, there's nothing you can do that will make me stop loving you. That's right. Wow. That's right. That is right. That's wonderful. That is so, so wonderful. Keep preaching. <laughs> That's the foolishness of the cross. To think it's that true. this God loves me so much that if I hated him so much, I wanted him to die and get the hell out of here, as it were. He still loves me. That's right. And that's, that, to me, is the, the power. That's right. Love personified. And that's the second point that he brings out is, is the, what greater, you know, demonstration of love. Because in Matthew 5, when Jesus says, you know, you've heard it said of them of old, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I'm going to tell you something different. And so Jesus is this great love 
And he's telling us different things than law or religion was saying. He's yeah. saying, you know, do not resist the evil person. Give people your cloak. Turn the other cheek. You know, love your neighbors and your enemies. A whole different paradigm. And it was just personified there at the cross when he didn't strike back. He didn't, you know, uh, resist the evildoer. He just did everything in, in perfect love. And what greater, what greater tribute uh, to us and what he gave us a good example of love. And, and, you know, I think that one of the reasons why that kind of a message uh, gets rejected is because in our culture, we tend to think of wisdom as a prescription that is just always true, the advice of how to handle a situation. But in Hebrew wisdom, um, probably the clearest example in the Old Testament is uh, the, the proverb that tells us, to answer a fool according to his folly, and then another proverb that tells us, don't answer the fool according <laughs> to his folly. You know, well, which is it? Well, you know, both are, are sort of true, but you may have to consider the options and decide which one is most uh, edifying, which one is most useful right now. Right, exactly. And, and I, so in some ways, when, when Jesus you know, talks about turning the other cheek, I don't think he's saying, let's all be doormats, let's all just be naive, gullible people that everyone can take advantage of. Um, I think that we have to realize, though, that when, when we're the victims of evil, we have to decide what what's the redemptive response here. And if there is one, to really be open to it and prefer it. Uh, so that, in some ways, I, I, I hear wisdom coming from a Hebrew culture as being don't make your decision until you've considered this as being a very, a, a very valid option. So I, there's a sense in which I don't, I don't even, I don't think we're, I don't interpret that scripture as telling me I should always turn the other cheek. But I think that I could find that it, to be a very disarming and very redeeming experience to be the victim of evil and to turn the other cheek and to find the person who's you know, trying to be my enemy, finding I'm not interested in being your enemy. Yeah, that's true. Bob, as you are talking, as we are talking with each other, I'm getting lots and lots and lots of text messages. <laughs> uh, the majority of them are applauding what you're saying, what we're saying, and they think that it's awesome. However, we do have some who are suggesting that we are saying that God is just too good what say you to that? <laughs> um, you know, if, if Anselm can get away with saying God is that greatest thing, greater than which you can't conceive, <laughs> was it him who said that something? I'm sure. Then, and, you know, I, which I, by the way, think is, is just crazy philosophy. Um, uh, that just turns God into some sort of a uh, antiseptic concept in my mind, but um, but as I said before, my understanding of God is not a power-based concept, but a character-based concept. You can't outdo the love of God. That is no right. No matter what. That is right. For me, that is the solid bottom line, and I find it regrettably vile. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, uh, not that I want to offend anyone. How do but, you mean um, that, Bob? <laughs> the, 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 it, it slanders the character of God. Absolutely. To suggest that his love is not far more reaching than we're capable of comprehending. That's true. That is so true. Uh, one comment was made that uh, you're suggesting that evil runs out of options until love wins. Can yes, you, I am. Can, can you speak a little bit more about that? Because we do have many people who are extremely curious as to what that means. Uh, go a little bit well, further into that, if you would. Well, think about it in your own life. If you've ever met anybody who's an habitual liar... Uh, when you first meet them, they're pretty good at telling you a story, and they, they, they win you over, and, and they soon burn you out. You <laughs> cease to be for them an option, and they have to go find someone else. Well, you know, um, there's only, they aren't going to be able to go so far until they now just have the reputation of being a liar, 
and people are not going to interact with them to the degree that, that they could and their options in life begin to, to just run out. Uh, evil has a way of burning all of the useful bridges behind it for the sake of the temporary gain. And, and I think that in the, the overall picture, we paint ourselves into a corner to where we have nowhere to go anymore. And until finally it all comes crashing down on us and we begin to see, and, and sometimes we do this because we don't really believe that the consequences down the road are going to be there. But when we realize that whatsoever you sow, you will also reap, um, that uh, after a while you discover that the reaping gets really expensive and uh, you've got to get to that point where you realize, you know, uh, the, the way of love is 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 the only way of, of of moving that in the end just expands the options and doesn't run out of them. Uh, it's uh, I mean it's, it, I can't remember what I, I think I I came up with that concept as a reaction to having read Viktor Frankl's book Man's Search for Meaning when he realized that the one thing they could never take from him in the concentration camp was his ability to choose how he would make sense of things. Wow. Powerful. That, that, is, that is so powerful. Uh, I want you to change, give us a paradigm shift here. That is, let's hear a little bit of your talent on the guitar. I mean, we're talking theology and people are, I mean, they're churning. Uh, and, and I remember when I left religion to follow Christ, it was a wonderful day. And my wife and I have just become so free, that is, in knowing the reality of the love of God, knowing something about his character has been everything to us. And it's, it's just life-changing. But many people are still struggling with the paradigm that that religion has these facts that are absolute. Uh, these facts that is that are called the Bible, and yeah. the Bible is worshipped. And most people look at it as if, well, you can't tell me that God loves everyone and everyone goes to heaven. You can't tell me what Bob is saying is true. Where is the proof text in the Scripture? And I think most people are trying to look to the scripture rather than being honest about the scripture. Well, you, I, there's a lot to be taken from scripture. The Bible says that you know all scripture is is God breathed and is useful, <laughs> but I, I don't know that it ever really made the claim that it was uh, the only source of authoritative uh, reality. But um, I, I, you know, I, I be, not being a, a, a I don't know where that line is for these other people in terms of what Bibleology is, but when one wants to interpret a verse in a way that is just um, absurd, just because that seems to be its grammatical sense, um, one has to ask, what could possibly be operating within a person that makes them okay with that? I wonder. Certainly. Uh, it's so. I mean, there's that level of honesty that I think is needed. I, I, I certainly don't, you know, disrespect the scripture, but I, I, I certainly feel that um, my view is far more biblical than other people might. But part of the reason is because I, mean, I don't even perceive the Bible as being the same sort of thing they do. Right. Do you think that Paul might have been stating something to dear Timothy? Because Timothy, at this particular time in history, he was extremely frightened. And back in that particular day, uh, the majority of the people around Timothy were not literate. They could not read. And one of the things that people feared a lot back in those days was um, writings. You had various writings, writings from the pagans, writings from all kinds of poets, writings from everywhere. Uh, I, I see that the Apostle Paul was trying to comfort this young man and his fears. If we look at Theopneustos, the term which you used as God breathed, could it possibly mean something along the lines that Paul was trying to encourage Timothy to consider all of the writings, not as an accuracy model, but 
everything Definitely that man not. is saying in some sense of the word has its connection with God, whether it's right or wrong. I, well, first of all, as we realize, this is the only place in the entire history of the Christian church that the word ever was used. Every other use of it was really a reference to this. When you have a word that only occurs one time, coined by Paul, I, I, I just fear this has got to be one of those words that's been churchified. What does it mean? I don't really know. I don't know. I, may, I take it as picturesque speech. Uh, and, and that, uh, first of all, you know, when, when we talk about God breathed, uh, that already is is a metaphor because sure. I you know does, does I, I, how much how much humidity is there in God's breath I you know I mean, it, 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 we're we're talking about something that 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 in a sense doesn't even really exist, uh, but it's used as a as an expression. Uh, we think of the breath of a person as the indication that they're alive. Uh, when we can feel their breath, we know they're close. Um, I, I, I see some pictures in here. Don't know entirely what all those pictures might have been, but I, I, I see the word as picturesque. There's a question. question moment. Uh, there's a question that uh, keeps popping up, and many of these questions are similar because you're talking about God's love so much, and I applaud that much in every way. Uh, this question is along these lines. How should a civil government like our country deal with an enemy attacking us violently? How would our Lord's new covenant words about loving our enemies apply to those situations? Well, I'll tell you what. In some ways, um, I, I'll, although I don't think it's too late to do something about mm -hmm. it, I think it's, it's uh, in some ways too late. And let's get honest. Most of the people in the Middle East became familiar with our brand of Christianity at the end of a sword during the Crusades. Most of the laws in, that, in those countries that outlawed Christianity were a result of the Crusades. We shoved true. Christ down their throats with a blade. Their experience of us is not what we have been taught in our history. And although I do think their reaction to a lot of this is very evil, I don't think these are just evil, crazy people who have gone off the deep end and are stark raving mad. Um, I, I, even recently, in recent history, some things that people in America just don't seem to want to know <coughs> is that, for example, uh, Iran, years ago, used to be a democratic country. A lot of people don't know that. They had a democracy. Their prime minister was a person who graduated from a college in France. And he was a great lover of not only democracy, but social democracy. And he also wanted to bring better uh, economy to Iran. And at that time, when he was president, all of the oil in Iran was belonged to British Petroleum. Or, well, no, the Iranian British uh, company, which then later became uh, BP. But uh, they wanted to nationalize the oil. Uh, Eisenhower and uh, Churchill didn't want that to happen because they knew we had to have access to that oil or we could not continue to be powerful nations. So a lie was concocted. It was, it was spun a story that this guy is really a communist, is going to go communist, he's a socialist, and they used the CIA and British intelligence to overthrow the government of Iran in a way that was never known by the American people for 26 years. And the overthrow went south, it fell apart, and this is how the Shah of Iran came to power and pr created a great despotic issue there. Now, most of the people in Iran, we didn't know it, but a lot of the people in Iran knew they lost their government because of what we did. And there's a lot of people in the Middle East who live in suffering under despots we created. And we aren't being honest about it. And um, I really believe that even the Palestinian-Israeli situation, which is just so terribly sad, was deliberately created 
so that we could make sure we had to have a military presence there next to the oil. I really believe personally that was the strategy. No, I don't care if anyone else really believes it, and, <laughs> and I'm not even really interested in proving it, and I don't care if I'm wrong. That's not the, the point being this. These people, some of them are our enemies because we have not been honest about how our policies and our behaviors have affected them. Now, I don't think this justifies their violence, right? but, I, but if we're going to just react as if our record isn't what it is, True. This is not going to solve the problem. Well, is this uh, one of the occasions where we don't need to be a doormat, you know, and, and we, you know, well, have well, to decide? Well, I think we, do, we definitely need to draw a line. We can't have them flying their airplanes, uh, flying our airplanes into our buildings. We can't have them doing that. Um, I, I think we need to stop that. I, I think that um, this, you know, I can turn my cheek, but it's not right for me to make you turn your cheek. And I think that we as a, as a society have a right to protect each other in our society. But I don't think we have the right to therefore be bullied. So I, I do think we need to stop uh, the, the terrorist plots. I do think we need a, a way of responding to it that is effective. But at the same time, let's get off this high horse where we mm -hmm. think that we're just these um, righteous victims who are hated for our freedoms. Right. That's a bunch of bull. Right. It, it's not that's right. Honest. That's I true. Agree. And this, this world will never know peace without that kind of honesty. I mean, you, you, it, it, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. And uh, it, it's it, so. Although I think everyone has the right to draw the lines and the boundaries properly, uh, I do think we need to look for a more redemptive response, and that includes coming clean for our own past violations of these people who hate us. That's true. You know, in a sense, that uh, governments remind me of denominations always fighting, never coming together. <laughs> and I, I, I'm wondering, Bob, if, if intelligent people, people who want to be intellectually honest, spiritually honest, scripturally honest, etc., can we develop a philosophy that rises above every government? that transcends all governments and start coming together so our globe can start a healing process. Is that possible? Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'd like to think that it is. Um, I, I, I guess when I say I don't know, I, I mean, I don't know if this is going to come to a head first uh, before we can do that. But I think that uh, either hopefully before it comes to a head or after it comes to a head, we will eventually uh, do that. Uh, as you look at the warfare of mankind, he's kind of disingenuously tried to civilize it some. <laughs> and I think we see ourselves moving in a direction. We have wars more, uh, look at the Gulf War, it was very well documented. And then we, uh, the, the Gulf War part two uh, was not as well documented because of the embedded uh, journalists who really had to spin a story in conformity with policies um, that they found out that you know when the American people know what's really going on uh, the, the policies don't seem to be able to go through and I'm just hoping that eventually there will come this global movement of saying let's be honest with what's really happening uh, war is a terrible, terrible thing, and the people who suffer from it, and all of the people who suffer from it, and the lack of precision that we pretend we don't have is, um, you know, they're sane people will eventually come to the point where they say, look, we got, we, we got to find some other way of dealing with this. We do have to deal with it, and I think we have every right to draw our lines firmly, but I think we have to also draw them honestly. Do you think our politicians are shaped by a philosophy or do you think that they are philosophy writers? Uh, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that, but I would say this. I, I, I you know, I, I've often said this when asked about this, um, the political questions. Uh, I had a conversation the other day on my Facebook page where my comment was, I, I perceive all of the political philosophies as mere um, uh, modalities. And that a person who's going to be honest is going to consider all the modalities. And so that I, I'm, I'm, I believe that a person who's a conservative or a person who's a liberal or a person who's a libertarian or a person who's a socialist or a person who's a communist, if, you, if you're given to any of these isms, 
you're mm -hmm. narrow-minded. I, I think each of them speak to the way of trying to solve society's problems from different angles, and I think each of them care about different things and try to solve them in different ways. And I think each of them possess a certain level of merit and each of them possess a certain amount of inefficacy. And I think we, we really need to be more open to debate whereby we consider an eclectic approach based on the various ways we could look at our issues. And politicians, unfortunately, have to be promoted by parties that have a plank and they have to be, they have to remain with the narrow-mindedness of their own party. And I don't think that will ever really work. So you're really suggesting that we re really need uh, a, a healthy table of discussion for things to change. And there is not one. That, that's uh, true. An honest table. Uh, and I, I, I don't know how much of it has to do with the fact that we have a black president. I, so I don't know how racism enters in it. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure. I think for some it does, for some it doesn't. But, but the... Mm -hmm. We first went through the, the Bush administration where the people who did not like Bush were, really felt that he, had, he was just a war criminal. And then comes along Obama, who then is perceived by the other side as a socialist who wants to ruin this country, maybe even a, uh, uh, a, a planted Muslim, right. you know, <laughs> and, and other absurd things. And the reactionary uh, things going on and the, the division and the fact that they're just not going to work together. Uh, this is not a healthy dynamic, and and I don't think that either party remaining narrowly committed to their own perspective is going to work, um, no matter what, because uh, we're we're really not uh, as you said. There's not an honest discussion. I need to be willing to really try to love the ideas of the other person for at least 15 minutes mm -hmm. before I can just dismiss them with my own uh, principles. Right. That's awesome. Th that's that's, that's very good advice. Yeah. Uh, so many times in theological debates, I think that sometimes we're more interested in monologue to monologue instead of real dialogue. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, what, what can we do to change that particular paradigm? I mean, there are so many people, for instance, on Facebook, there are so many people uh, in this conversation, left and right, with all different kinds of ideas. And, you know, our idea is simply to bring people together and start yeah. learning how to listen, not just speak, but listen. And if we can get people to stay there and be faithful at the table of discussion, I think at the end of the day, we might see some real change. And, and I, Yeah. I, I would like to see us, um, first of all, dialogue is absolutely essential. The other thing that's absolutely essential is finding a way of not having to agree while still talking. Certainly. Uh, th that's the first step. Uh, so that we're really, we're, I can never really entertain an idea I'm never exposed to. And I can't entertain it until I've been exposed to it enough that I can really now start to think of it in some Thing other than a caricature or or straw man version and uh, by understanding the other person better I might actually be able to con to develop first of all possibly an appreciation for what they have to say and and convert myself to their particular point of view or I might discover what it is that causes them to feel this makes so much sense and I now have a better way of helping them to see it differently Right. I'll never find that without that discussion. Wow. I, one of the things I do, I was going to say, was to model it. Do that. You know, open it up. Don't try to control uh, people's thinking. Share your, your own thinking as a resource, but allow people to uh, accept or reject what you have to say because it works for them or not work for them at the moment as, and let them struggle with it the way they will or won't, rightly or wrongly. Um, it's it's the only way that that can work. So um, modeling it, I suppose, is w when when you go and see that done with a group of people who don't necessarily see eye to eye, and you watch them do that. Wow. <laughs> now, similar to that, I remember one time I had to go visit a uh, Jewish rabbi, and I was it was part of an assignment I was working on in a class I was taking on multicultural psychology. 
I was going to go see this rabbi to get his perspective on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And uh, he was very, very uh, generous to be able to meet with me, and he knew what my purpose was in talking to him. And um, yeah, he, he felt that it was going to be a, uh, a useful thing to do and was confident that I wasn't coming there to give him grief or trouble or whatever. And so I, I met him there at the synagogue on a Wednesday while they were uh, conducting a scripture study that was running over time. And, and I said, finish your study. Don't, you know, don't, I, I got time. So, and I sat there while they went through the study. And they were going through all these different scriptures. And what they did with it was each person in the room expressed what they thought was a possible way of understanding it. And, and they entertained everything from the outlandish to the practical to the whatever. And they all took a moment to love that idea. And they all took a moment to hate that idea. And then they didn't conclude anything about the idea. They just moved on to the next idea. And they did this with all of them. I was impressed that, that they would do this. They really took the scripture apart and, and tried to look at it every which way and didn't even try to come to a conclusion. But they all were exposed to a wide variety of options. And I, I really liked that. I thought that was awesome. <coughs> You know, to get people into a healthy dialogue is is something that we applaud, and your rhetoric here on these points is is just point on. Uh, I'd like to ask you to pick up your guitar, and <laughs> I, no, if I do that, I'm going to have to shut my mic off so that you are, don't get are any you? Uh, feedback. Okay. And while while you're doing that, I'm going to encourage people to get uh, on the phone, send us some more text questions, comments. Etc. The number is 850-572-7441. And we're going to dedicate this to my father. Uh, he's a lead guitar player, and he does an awesome job. And uh, I want uh, my father just to be amazed at the talent of Bob. And so uh, uh, Bob has been amazing, honey. I know it. He's, I'm he's, sure enjoying it. Oh, yeah. He, he's he's really deep in theology. He's great at linguistics, and yet he's got this comical side. And then he's a musician. He's just well-rounded. Uh, no one can hate you, Bob. <laughs> now, can you hear me? I yes. can. Okay. Uh, let me just say by a little bit way of introduction, uh, I know you, from listening to some stuff you've done that, that you like the blues. And I'm not a blues musician, but I like to try to expand my... Uh, my horizons. So uh, I just thought I'd put this thing together, and uh, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, I don't have the blues, but it's a kind of a blues-based uh, non-blues. So uh, this is my attempt at that. It'd just be a little instrumental. Okay. And, and I have to shut my mic off while this happens, so that I can, so I can hear it without the, the earphones. So I'll be kind of incommunicado for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yep, there we go.
Wow. I'm my guitar away. <laughs> I tell you what, I've got people just writing, he rocks, he rocks. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful. That is so so wonderful, Bob. Uh, I want you. Okay, I can hear you now. He can hear you. Oh, okay. What uh, we have people just writing in. Uh, Bob uh, Greaves, he rocks. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. How long have you been playing? I got my first guitar on Christmas Day, nineteen fifty-seven. And uh, it, it, when I picked that thing up, I just seemed to know what to do with it. And <laughs> I was, you know, playing Christmas carols the next day, uh, figuring out D chords, C chords, G chords, and I was only six, you know. Mm. But um, and then I was about twelve when I got my got a hold of a Gretsch Corsair, the first real professional kind of guitar I had. And uh, it was a sense of it just it just came to me, you know. I, in fact, in some ways, I, I think of myself as a person who's got, you know, somewhat average ability, but I've just been doing it for so long that I've, I've picked up an awful lot along the way. Uh, Understatement. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Understatement. Sometimes you need to take a break and applaud yourself for a while. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, I love the guitar. It's, 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 I'll tell you, it's, it's the one thing that has been with me since I was six years old that I've always used as a way of... Um, just expressing myself, and uh, uh, I just love love playing the guitar. It's uh, it, 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 it's and I like I like the music. I like the music industry, and of course, I, since I'm a teacher of sound engineering, I get to go to work and and play with this awesome equipment and stuff, and, and talk to people about it, and they pay me to do this. It's just <laughs> wow. awesome. you know? I haven't worked a day in my life. You know? <laughs> it's, it's it's just a bunch of fun, you know. Let's talk about universalism. Sure. Um, that's where you are right now. I, there's many different kinds of universalism. I, I would I would call myself a, a universal reconciliationist. Okay. And uh, uh, and uh, that is mostly because I do see the authority authentic process of spiritual realization being absolutely essential. But I just don't see that process as something that is, uh, by design, created by a God who somehow uh, is going to lose anybody. Uh, and and I, I do think that, uh, so in, there's a sense in which, although I wouldn't... Um, let, let me use one of those church words for just a moment, uh, and we'll we'll explain it away later. But so I, I wouldn't see everyone as currently in that subjective experience of being saved. But I, I, I would see that as the eventual destiny. But the process of confronting self, confronting the call of love, confronting the love of God, and and being just radically altered by this reality and this experience and the uh, and l coming to that union with God and his love is an essential process for everyone so I don't believe that you know uh, do whatever you want uh, live however you please and, and it's just all gonna work out in the end no matter what uh, there's a lot of work to be done and it will not be done until it's done so I would see reconciliation as something that has to happen I just believe that uh, one way or another, it's destined to occur. Uh, do you have any other question you want to ask before I say something more about it? Or uh, there, there, there is something that concerns me, and I, and I, I, I would like for you to address it. Sure. I, I think that there are so many different kinds of universalism, and one thing that I know true to be about you is that you love the objective approach. I'm not finding that all models of universalism are objective. Would you agree with that? Uh, I would, yes. And, and I think that also some of it comes from the fact that we're dealing with a text that comes from a, a culture that deals with some of these issues very differently than, than we would in our culture, and we don't realize that. Um, 
and unfortunately, it takes sometimes one of these anthropological scholars to come along and tell us how they deal with it differently because since we're not a part of that culture, it isn't just like falling off a log for us. Otherwise, it would be. But um, I think in the Bible um, that, that the people who came from the biblical culture were not the kind of people who spoke about things you know, metaphysically or descriptively to, to tell us what they are, uh, but that they realized that that things are what they are, but they're also what we experience them to be. And I think that there was that kind of a dualism in in the Semitic culture where they dealt with things as they are but unknown and as they are as experienced, and yet that isn't quite what it really is. And when we read texts in the Bible that some are really in one vein and one in the other vein, it's like, well, what is it saying? Is it everybody? Is it nobody? Is it this? Is it that? And so I think that there's some real room for honest confusion that then as people are trying to deal with some of these verses, it, uh, it, it results in a lot of these different flavors. When it comes to the Protestant movement or the Catholic movement, what would you say to those two different groups that is about a different approach that is an objective approach? Uh, I, well, first of all, the, the relationship we have with God is intensely direct and personal. And there are no go-betweens between us and God. And so therefore, ultimately, all of our faith is really, for each of us, a very genuine, authentic experience between us and the God who lives in all who know him. Uh, and, and therefore, we are all very mystically connected to each other. And I, I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to convince them of this, but I perceive the church, as it were, as a mystical body. And I don't think that the organization is anything other than a way of getting things done. But the organization called church isn't the biblical concept of church. So I, I see the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church as usurpers of the identity of church. My local church is everybody who's within the proximity of my reach living here in Binghamton and knows Jesus, no matter how fundamentalist, liberal, conservative, universalist, not universalist, charismatic, whatever. Um, that. The, these, this is my church. These are the people. I, I'm connected to them. If Christ lives in them without regard to where they are, how they got there, or how they got it figured out, or how, how, you know, how crazy I am or they are, uh, this is it. And uh, that the building that I might be going to uh, might be a place where we can get a lot of things done, but that should never become for me my local church. Do you think that Christ was in all from the beginning, or has that been a process, or was it something that happened at a particular time in history? I hope I blow you away with my answer. <laughs> I think it's both and. I think that from the objective, universal perspective of God, we were in Christ from the foundation of the earth. I believe that from his standpoint, that's where we are. I believe that from our standpoint, we do not experience ourselves as in Christ until we embrace the reconciliation. And so there is possibility that there's this objective universal reality from God's perspective of Christ in all. But from our subjective personal experience, it's not until we personally participate with a God who will not violate us uh, that we actually begin to then um, nurture the, uh, w what that is going to do. So I see it as actually both, and I think there are verses that speak to both. You know, um, the, the Bible says, you know, for whosoever believes in him, as many as received him. And there's verses like this, but there's also... Um, I, made a, I got a list here of all the things that the Bible says. You can find a Bible verse that clearly states each of these things. God loves all humanity. All humanity has been gifted with the grace of God. All humanity is elected in Christ. All are represented by Christ. All died 
in Christ. All are redeemed in Christ. All are forgiven in Christ. All are reconciled in Christ. All are adopted in Christ. All are saved by Christ. All are given life in Christ. All are have their righteousness in Christ. All are blessed in Christ. All are in Christ and all are drawn to Christ. You can find Bible verses that state these specific things completely. And yet you also find other verses that uh, you know, where we have become the righteousness of Christ and God, where uh, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So I think the Bible is actually speaking to this other cultural way of understanding it, God's standpoint and our standpoint. Our standpoint is the imperfect of personal subjective experience, and God's standpoint is the recognition and the knowledge of all that he has. And so... Um, I think that leaves us, if we're trying to reconcile this all into one little concept, with a conundrum that cannot be resolved. And that's why it leaves me coming to the point of not being a universalist, but being a reconciliationist. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to ask you, and uh, if you want to avoid the question, I can understand why, but I doubt if you will. <laughs> that's just not your style. No. If Jesus would not have come, would we go to heaven anyway? Well, I wonder if that's a question that's kind of like, uh, can God make a rock so big he can't move? Um, if, if you and I never met, we can't have a relationship. And if you and I do meet, and it goes terribly badly, we probably wouldn't have a relationship. There had to be an encounter for this relationship to develop. Uh, so, to me, um, I would say it is possibly precisely because if Christ hadn't come, we couldn't go to heaven. That's why he came, because that was an unacceptable option to God. And that this is part of how God will do whatever it takes to bring his beloved home. So, um, I, 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 I see the process as essential, but then, but then again, um, it's not the process. It's again the character of God. That's right. Where would we be if God did not love us? He came because he loved us, and so his coming is in some ways irrelevant because it, it's, it's, it's a manifestation of the love he already had, and it's the love that makes the difference. So in a, in a sense, what you're saying is all of this was a reality before he created anything. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But there's a difference and, between that and it being manifested. And there's a and, difference between that and us experiencing it. Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and particularly for us as human beings, we, you know, we, we live in this three dimension plus time experience and, um, I, I don't know how God lives <laughs> in terms of that other thing. I don't know what to think of that. But, um, uh, yeah, so I think it, uh, that, that's why it's, it's the both and thing. And uh, so, uh, but, but to me, the bottom line is the character of God. What is there about the character of God that really changed you from being a traditional pastor to what you are today. What was the pivotal thing that changed you? I mean, dramatically so. Um, coming to the, the indescribable experience of knowing that <clears throat> I was loved to a degree that I, I couldn't even make sense of. And I don't ever say these things like, oh, I'm not worthy of his love. I think that God made human beings so incredibly delicious and awesome that he'd be a fool to not love us all. That's right, yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, uh, that's good, that's good. Can, can you state that again, please? <laughs> I, I, I said that I believe that the, the image of God that we've been created in is such a beautiful thing that God would be a fool to not love us and that in spite of the, all the things that have gone wrong, um, 
there's something very worthy uh, uh, in what we just are in our own existence, just ontologically, who we are as an experience and as a being. Uh, that's very, very valuable in spite of the fact that there are some other real problems. Men. So you don't think that God's created children need to feel unworthy of his love, protection, support, or in his inheritance? Not at all. Not Thank at all. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's, uh, he's not that irresponsible a father. And, um, you know, ultimately, I didn't ask to be created. And uh, this wasn't my decision. And whatever the deal is going to be, uh, God is going to have to accept responsibility for the deal being the deal, and I don't, I don't, I can't perceive him as being someone who wouldn't be. We have a lot of atheists who are asking very tough questions, very good questions. What's the best reply that you have for all of the atheists who come our way, who are really, honestly seeking truth about a real God? What would you say to an atheist? Well, first of all, I think I'd want to commend them for possessing the kind of integrity that causes them to say that a lot of the theology they've been hearing is absolute nonsense. Amen. So I, I, I certainly don't fault them for uh, resolving these issues so far in going in that direction. And I mean, not this, not that I want to speak badly of my brothers and sisters in Christ, but um, we have a lot of people who think that just because they believe that they somehow know everything, and <laughs> they start saying some crazy things that if you start to contradict them, they feel, oh, you're a heretic, and and we, what we, it's it's kind of like we've got, <laughs> like they say, you know, they, when you got the 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 the, the, the crazy people running the, the asylum, um, <laughs> we we have people putting pressure on the church to take positions and to stay with positions who have done nothing but but defend the tradition all out of fear right it, it's crazy uh, to me there's no intellectual honesty in it at all and a person uh, most atheists tend to be more intellectual and and i think that there's a certain level of their integrity that you have to violate in order to push down their throats the way Christianity has traditionally been expressed. And so I, I would commend them for having stood their ground uh, in that respect. But I would like them to also consider um, the fact that what if the God they reject ought to be rejected but is really kind of a bait and switch for some other sort of God. Um, for me, I know that the bottom line is that when I experienced what it was to know deep in my gut as a very subjective experience, God adores me. He loves me. And, and as special as I am to him, I'm not in the least bit unique in that respect, that, that, that every human being I, I meet is somebody that, that God deeply adores. Equally, he doesn't have any favorites, and when when I experience abiding in Christ as being fundamentally based on that love for me, the way I have thrived as a human being, the way I have grown, the the security, the maturity that has come my way has grown as a result of resting in that, and I think that um, the atheists can find that um, you know. That should be something for them to think about, whether or not that is uh, missing in their life. Um, you know, I'm a derived creature. Uh, I didn't create myself. And um, to know that that which is underivable loves me is, uh, I don't know, to me it just it turns away all naysayers to my dignity and my value as a human being. Well, that's good. That's good. You know, so many times in in Christianity, I think that we we have been extremely disingenuous about what the text is and what an atheist is. And, and a lot of people really don't realize this. An atheist is not necessarily a person who doesn't believe in God. Many atheists are deists. And my mm -hmm. point is, 
the rejection of theology simply creates the mindset of what an atheist technically is. And, and all theology is man-made. Even my theology is man-made. The reality of the event of the cross may be real, but my understanding of it is my understanding of it. And so um, let the theologies come and go. Let them. My wife wrote that down, and I want you to repeat that. All theology is man-made, even mine. <laughs> and so state that again, Bob. I want it on film. Uh, bye. I just, it just rolled out again. I, uh, <laughs> I, you know, all theology is is man-made. We, uh, but the event of the cross, for example, is is an event that happened. But my understanding of it is my understanding of it. And uh, so, you know, it's the event itself that is important, not the way I understand it. Christ, the person, is my savior, not the Christ, the concept. And um, you know, so that. In a sense, I, I'm not loyal to my own theology. Uh, if I had good reason for thinking differently, I'd do that. And, and you know, fortunately, I'm not attached to any particular church, so I'm really free to just change my mind if that makes good sense to me. And I, uh, nobody's going to entangle me. Uh, they mm -hmm. might find me not turning the other cheek on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. That is wonderful. Uh, we, we've been uh, asked over and over again that uh, lots of people are requesting that you end the show by playing another uh, tune or so on with your guitar. That would be amazing. Um, but I, I want you to speak to us just for a moment about the working of the Holy Spirit. In other words... Do you think that God has only attempted to speak to the ancients and not to the modern? Well, I, I there's a lot about that that I I have to say I I'm pleasantly uncertain of that I I don't think that. Um, that God is limited in any manner from the things that he might do. You know, I am among many people who would uh, state that there have been times when I've had visions, when I when things have happened, when that, and and I'm fully willing to admit that, you know, maybe, maybe I had too many meds or something, I don't know, but uh, it doesn't matter to me. But um, since, my, since my theology and my, my concept it tends to be more character-based, um, I guess I don't. I don't care if he does or doesn't. Uh, uh, but um, I think that uh, that since each of us as individuals are so different, that um, when Jesus was speaking to Peter and to John about what the future held for them, and uh, you know, they Peter didn't seem like it. Um, I really can't speak for what God is going to do with other people and uh, what they really need or what it's going to take. But I, I just trust that uh, whatever it's going to take, that's what God is going to do, and um, and whatever it is they really need. But so you know, can God speak to people today? Uh, now, first of all, if we're speaking figuratively, um, I think that the closeness of God speaks volumes. The uh, uh, like a picture can s speak a thousand words to know one is loved by God. Um, there are not enough books in the world to contain the reality of that. Uh, but um, I certainly don't accept the idea that for all that God has, say, like a will for their life or a person to marry a job to do, I think that he might, and if he does so, he will make that plain and clear to them. But uh, I don't think people should waste their time looking for it. They should just be abiding with Christ and busy doing the things that are a good thing for them to be doing in the meantime. And if he's got something for them to do, he'll interrupt them. So I don't, I don't know if that's the kind of thing you're speaking to, but I, I guess I don't, I, I don't know that it really has changed through all of history at all. Maybe we even have prophets today. And uh, although if, if someone were a prophet, I might suggest they... They just do the work and, and, and not say anything about their identity. <laughs> it, it could be dangerous. Religion has created lots of insecurity. 
Uh, yeah. L- lots of people are insecure who are listening to us tonight. What can you say tonight that would help them take the first step towards being secure? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd want to I'd want to just maybe alter their focus just a touch and say that it's very possible that religion, and by that I mean the idea of believing in God, uh, maybe that's also just as much a victim of the insecurity, and that I think really what may be going on is that people are insecure, and religious people use their religion to promote their insecurity. And so religion gets used for that purpose. Uh, religion gets used for power, and powerful people make non-powerful people feel insecure because that's where they want them. Uh, but uh, so if a person is, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's something I could say. I suppose uh, more than anything, the people who are insecure uh, need to know that, that they are loved. And they need to be loved by people who love them. They're not going to take advantage of their insecurity and who, who seek to possess a relationship with them that encourages them to learn to stand on their own two feet and not put up with the people who would want to control them. Yeah, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me because a lot of times someone might not be able to feel God or understand the love of God right now, but I think something tangible, even though I do believe the love of God is tangible, but not everyone does, they can't all feel it at the same time. It's a, but very, it's a very subjective that's right. thing, and that's we right. can't make it. I, I believe the reality of God's love is an objective universal, but the, but the experience of God's right. love is definitely the subjective experience. And, and, and I can't give that to you. That's true. But we can give it to each other, I do believe. It, it's the closest that we can I, come. Yeah, and it's right. that love I thing you love talked you. about. Be busy uh, showing love, and I, I think that's the key to just about yeah. everything. Yeah, you know, when uh, I'll never forget, um, you know, when I was raised in a home, it was highly critical, very critical. And I, I think I came out of that home as a young adult, a very destroyed person, uh, n- no confidence in myself, and very, very insecure. And, I, you know, I, I went through my attempts at adulthood <laughs> with a real um, I- I- inept to my sense of adequacy to life and it really showed in the way that I just you know just had difficulty doing things well but I, I remember I met a man who was um, he was a pastor in another in another church and I, I went to talk to him and I spoke to him about you know the issues that I was struggling with even just personally and this man gave to me the most awesome and genuine respect as a human being I'd ever received and I was a little bit frightened to go to him to talk to him because you know you you start unveiling your vulnerability to other people you're you're taking a real risk and this man's response to me was a love that reminded me of the love I I, I believed I was getting from God and it it jump-started that as a far more real experience for me and helped me to get into that experience. And so the fact that I was in a relationship with a person that I believe had a genuine and mature love for me as a human being was an awesome experience. It redeemed me. It, it, it made a huge difference in my life. And um, so I think that there's a far more powerful being an honest, authentically loving person. Yes. Uh, we have no idea where that will go. I wish I were better at it, you know? You know, I really appreciate your honesty, your heart, uh, your gentleness, your humility. I mean, you really are genuine, and that means the world to my wife and I. It, you know, I, I'm throughout this conversation, I've been tearing up because it's it's rare to meet someone who is like you and it's oh, thank you. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's 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 just you know it's just wonderful uh we've been getting text messages about every two to three seconds and i have to multitask while i'm <laughs> sitting up here and so uh this question keeps coming up and i'm going to read the question from this one gentleman who presented it but this question has come up at least seven or eight times 
uh, do we go to heaven or are we in heaven? That is the presence of God. Location is an absurd concept when dealing with even the concept of what is the universe. Uh, I mean, if you study quantum physics, yeah, uh, our experience of it is is definitely limited. So, I, first of all, I, I'm not so sure I even understand the concept of location when it comes to after death. I so, I, but Jesus definitely said the kingdom of God is within you. Uh, you know the union that we have with 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 God, with Christ, as, as being His children, being part of His family. Um, I don't care where you are; that's heaven. <laughs> you know? uh, and and if there was ever any place where that ain't happening, I don't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so you're really so, not into place theory theology, you know that place. No, no, no. Oh, there you go. Uh, that's that's wonderful. Now, that's, I would say that uh, you didn't ask me the question, but I, I would say both are true. You know, it's well, heaven okay, here. We're, we're going to be someplace. I mean, if we exist, uh, there's got to be some corporal sense of it. I would imagine. Yeah. So, yeah. but but you know, um, the, the analogy, uh, you know, the streets of gold and stuff like that is is um, I, I don't think it's a marketing ploy. <laughs> I think it's an attempt to describe the indescribable. Paul said, I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man what God has for us. So what is it going to be like? We have no idea, but I think you're going to like it. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, I would like to ask you a favor. Can you end this with something with a guitar and then just come back and make your final statements? Okay, uh, I, I would only just doodle and just play some things, um, see what happens. <laughs> that, that, that's wonderful. I, I enjoy just several different kinds of riffs, uh, whatever style that you would like. Uh, uh, we just really enjoy uh, the guitar. Okay, uh, let me see if I can find something here that uh, I have to look on my computer. to. to I usually play the backing tracks and stuff like that. Um, used to play in a band, but um, I, I just didn't have time for a lot of that a while back, and so about a year ago I, I, I left. But let me see if I can uh, find something here. Um, I'm, I'm a huge Beatles fan, and uh, let me, let me see. I'm going to have to change to a different guitar here. Hold on a second. And uh, how much time do we have? Oh, we have as long as you want, but uh, we don't have to end at 10. We're just targeting 10, but uh, go ahead. Yeah. Just okay. relax and enjoy. I'll see if I, I have to take this off here. Mm. He's a wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. person. Wow. I hope that you guys are enjoying uh, Bob Greaves. He's an extraordinary individual. Uh, so honest, so full of energy, so full of ideas, and 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 really transparent. This is wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. This is a uh, Gretsch Country Gentleman, one of my favorite guitars. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I might have to um, I'm a uh, I'm a huge Beatles fan so can I, I I don't have a mic set up for proper vocals but is it all right if I just play a Beatles song oh that would be awesome okay let's see uh, <laughs> I hope this comes through with the right volume. And uh, I, I created this backing track, by the way, in, in one of my classes um, that I was teaching them how to re re record stuff. And uh, yeah, so anyway, 
I, I so I did this. It's a Beatles song, and I, I this is the song that made me decide. Yeah, I gotta play rock and roll. So as I recorded <laughs> this, I also recorded Paul McCartney's Countin. So you, you'll hear Paul count it in, but the rest is all all me playing different instruments. One, two, three, five. awesome that was awesome <laughs> can you hear me now oh mm -hmm. i can i tell you what my wife and i would love to thank you for being i mean we we just want to thank you so much for being with us tonight uh, you have shared from your heart uh you have told us so many things that that we are just uh we're just overwhelmed about uh i mean it's just it's just amazing uh, that you have this heart of love and you've had this journey that's been going on for years and we're so thankful to know you and to be your friend. And um, did you have anything to say? Uh, I'm just going to reiterate everything you said. It was awesome. And I just can't, you know, stop thinking about that six-year-old boy just feeling that presence of God. And as you were talking, I thought, you know, I bet at times he really thinks that six years old that's the closest he's ever been to God, and that makes a lot of sense to me. So right off the bat, you had me from six-year-old and the warmth of God. That was a great story. So thanks so much, Bob. Oh, thank you for, uh, for inviting me on, and I, I enjoyed the, the discussion. I hope that it uh, uh, proves meaningful and useful to, to those who have been watching. I hope we answered some questions from people who... Uh, had them, and I hope that we actually created some questions for those who who didn't have them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> if you do us the honor uh, of simply saying something in closing that would help those people who are hurting right now, 
There are so many people going through all kinds of pains, that is sickness, hunger, financial dilemmas, etc. Could you speak to that and close this out, please? The, uh, the struggles of life are, are, are very real. Uh, they are in some ways not fair. They are, are in some ways caused by others. They are in some ways honestly caused by ourselves. Not all of them are necessarily guaranteed to get fixed, uh, which is sad to say, uh, for many reasons. We might not discover what role we're playing and stop doing those things. We might not be able to get out from under the people doing things to us. Uh, we, uh, we might not be able to figure out how to put enough things together. But I would encourage you this. Find people who love you. Find people who care about you. People who won't necessarily indulge you, but who <laughs> will hold you to the high value of who you are and uh, encourage you in that way. And as you find yourself, you'll discover that although everything doesn't work, enough things do work that will make everything worthwhile and a real difference. Never give up on your own dignity. Thank you, Bob, wow. and we do yeah. love you. i tell you what, that's awesome. It is. Breath of fresh air. Uh, Bob has been wonderful to us all. With this, we say good night, and you guys have a wonderful day in Christ. Thank you for your time. Hello, Bob. I wanted to go back there so you could...